And now we cut across live to Glasgow, where Prime Minister Boris Johnson Trying is addressing up, the COP26 summit. To pull, to turn it off, while a red digital clock ticks down remorselessly to a detonation that will end human life as we know it. And we are in roughly the same position, my fellow global leaders, as James Bond today. Except that the tragedy is, this is not a movie. And the doomsday device is real. And the clock is ticking to the furious rhythm of hundreds of billions of pistons and turbines and furnaces and engines with which we are pumping carbon into the air faster and faster, record outputs, and quilting the earth in an invisible and suffocating blanket of CO2, raising the temperature of the planet with a speed and an abruptness that is entirely man-made. And we know what the scientists tell us, and we have learned not to ignore them. Two degrees more, and we jeopardize the food supply for hundreds of millions of people as crops wither, locusts swarm. Three degrees, and you can add more wildfires and cyclones, twice as many, five times as many droughts, and 36 times as many heat waves. Four degrees, and we say goodbye to whole cities. Miami, Alexandria, Shanghai, all lost beneath the waves. And the longer we fail to act, the worse it gets, and the higher the price when we are eventually forced by catastrophe to act. Because humanity has long since run down the clock on climate change. It's one minute to midnight on that doomsday clock, and we need to act now. If we don't get serious about climate change today, it will be too late for our children to do so tomorrow. I was there with, with many of you in Copenhagen 11 years ago when we acknowledged we had a problem. I was there in Paris six years ago when we agreed to net zero and to try to restrain the rise in the temperature of the planet to 1.5 degrees. And all those promises will be nothing but blah, 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 to coin a phrase. And the anger and the impatience of the world will be uncontainable unless we make this COP26 in Glasgow the moment when we get real about climate change. And we can. We can get real on coal, cars, cash and trees. We have the technology to deactivate that ticking doomsday device, not, not all at once. I'm afraid it's too late for that. But one by one, and with ever greater speed and efficiency, we can begin to close down those billions of hydrocarbon combustion chambers that you find currently in every corner of the planet. We can phase out the use of cars with hydrocarbon internal combustion engines by 2035. We can do that. We in the UK are leading by ending new sales by 2030. We can end the use of coal-fired power stations. We can do it by 2040 in the developing world, 2030 in the richer nations. We can plant hundreds of millions of trees, a trillion. It's not technologically difficult. And halt and reverse deforestation by 2030. Not just because it's a spiritually uplifting and beautiful thing to do, but because that is the way to restore the balance of nature and to fix carbon in the air. And as we look at the green industrial revolution that's now needed around the world, we in the developed world must recognize the special responsibility we have to help everybody else to do it. Because it was here in Glasgow 250 years ago that James Watt came up with a machine that was powered by steam, that was produced by burning coal. And yes, my friends, we've brought you to the very place where the doomsday machine began to tick. 
And even though for 200 years the industrialised countries were in complete ignorance of the problem that they were creating, we now have a duty to find those funds. $100 billion a year that was promised in Paris by 2020, but which we won't deliver until 2023, to help the rest of the world to move to green technology. But we cannot and will not succeed by government spending alone. We in this room can deploy hundreds of billions, no question. But the market has hundreds of trillions, and the task now is to work together to help our friends to decarbonise, using our funds, the funds we have in uh, development assistance, and working with all the multilateral development banks so that in the key countries that need to make progress, we can jointly identify the projects that we can help to de-risk so that the private sector money can come in, in just the same way that it was the private sector that enabled the UK to end our dependence on coal, become the, the Saudi Arabia of wind. We have the technology. We can find the finance, and we must. And the question for us all today is whether we have the will. And my fellow leaders, as I look around this room, I don't want to put too, too find a, a finer point on it, but you know, we all talk about what we're going to do in 2050 or 2060. I don't think it will escape the, the notice of the crowds of, of young people outside, the billions who are watching around the world, half of the population of the world under 30, that the average age of this conclave of, of world leaders, uh, I'm afraid to say, is over 60. I fully intend to be alive in 2060. I will be a mere 94 years old, even if I'm not still in Downing Street. But you never know. But the children, the children who will judge us are, are, are children not yet born, and their children. And we are now coming centre stage before a vast and uncountable audience of, of posterity, and we mustn't fluff our lines or miss our cue, because if we fail, they will not forgive us. They will know that Glasgow was the historic turning point when history failed to turn. They will judge us with bitterness and with a resentment that eclipses any of the climate activists of today. And they will be right. COP26 will not and cannot be the end of the story on climate change. Even if this conference ends with binding global commitments for game-changing real-world action, two weeks from now, smokestacks will still belch in industrial heartlands. Cows will still belch in their pastures, even if some brilliant Kiwi scientists are teaching them how to be more polite. Cars powered by petrol and diesel, will still choke congested roads in the world's great cities. No one conference could ever change that. If summits alone solve climate change, then we wouldn't have needed 25 previous COP summits to get where we are today. But while COP26 will not be the end of climate change, it can and it must mark the beginning of the end. In the years since Paris, the world has slowly and with great effort and pain built a lifeboat for humanity. And now is the time to give that lifeboat a, a mighty shove into the water, like some great liner rolling down the slipways of the Clyde. Take a sextant sighting. And there we have uh, Prime Minister Boris Johnson with an impassioned speech at the opening of the COP26 summit in Glasgow. Now, for more on this, we are being joined by our correspondent Laura McInisherwood, who is uh, joining us live on the broadcast for the crucial COP26 summit from Glasgow. Thank you for being with us. Now, the much-awaited summit has started. 
Uh, we just heard from Prime Minister Boris Johnson with a strong speech on what is expected and what needs to be achieved at this summit. Take us through some of the big points mentioned there. Well, yeah, UK uh, Prime Minister Boris Johnson has said that he wants to tackle uh, coal, cars, cash and trees. So planting those, of course, but and offering more cash to other nations too, but cutting the others. So cutting the uh, fossil fuels that cars use uh, and vehicles as well to get around, instead moving to sort of electric or hybrid versions that way. And also cutting uh, carbon emissions. We've had warnings from meteorologic meteorologists uh, across the world basically saying that uh, levels of carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases in the atmosphere are getting to a point where they're at their limits really and the uh, warming that's taking place around the globe is accelerating if that continues then it will set off a string of feedback cycle cycles across the uh, the world where ice caps continue to melt and then more heat is absorbed into the sea because it is seen as a darker color of course uh, on the earth's surface and that in turn will warm that again and continue this warming cycle continuously the impacts of that around the globe are going to be huge more desertification uh, more flooding We've seen a lot of those events recently and, of course, perhaps displacing many populations and affecting lives and livelihoods. So here at this summit, it is essential, uh, Boris Johnson says, to try to tackle that. He's also looking to push on the finance angle, getting uh, developed nations to pledge to hit a $100 billion uh, mark of offering finance to the Global South every year. That's a target that's been missed every year since 2013. So the pressure really is on here to bring nations together so that they can work together on tackling climate change. Right, Laura. Now, we've seen uh, Prime Minister Johnson and uh, Antonio Guterres welcoming the world leaders. Uh, we are expecting big announcements from leaders on reaching net zero. Now, earlier, Prime Minister Modi spoke about the carbon emissions space, pointing to the historical emissions and responsibility of the richer nations here. And uh, he is also expected to launch two initiatives. Take us through this. Yeah, exactly. So this is a, a sentiment that's coming from a lot of nations that are developing or their economies are still continuing to grow. They are essentially saying, do you know what, Western nations, you've had your time. You've had your chance with fossil fuels and development that way. And actually, it is our, the legacy of those nations that's causing so many issues for others. They want those nations in the global north to really pull together, uh, cut back and take a lot of the weight here, put it on their own shoulders, as well as offering, offering finance uh, for those other nations that are developing to move their economies towards a greener way of working. When it comes to uh, Modi, he's going to meet with UK Prime Minister Boris Johnson later today, we understand. That's one of the first bilateral meetings that, go that is going to take place here in Glasgow. We understand that they're going to talk about a solar alliance, potentially this launch of a kind of a network uh, where solar power can be shared between different nations. But you're right, uh, Modi is going to be pressuring Boris Johnson for leaders to do more uh, and take the weight of this climate crisis. Right, Laura, thank you very much for joining us with all the latest coming out of Glasgow. Great to have you on the broadcast. We are now available in your country. Download the app now. Get all the news on the move.